My name is Jason Daggett. I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I work for a company named Galwa. We do kind of um, weird, interesting things. Maybe you've heard of us. Um, we often work for government agencies. So this work was funded in, pi in part by IARPA. IARPA was interested in secure computation. In this context, secure means uh, privacy preserving. Security in general could mean many different things. So IARPA, uh, they wanted to run a program on secure computing. And they didn't really know what were the hard problems and what were the easy problems in that space. So they hired us to sort of figure out the low-hanging fruit and try to solve those problems so that when they put out the big proposal, they could, they could ask for more interesting offers from people. Um, I'm going to try to keep this talk fairly high level because uh, some parts of it are like deeply theoretical. Um, but I want to make this you know, as widely accessible as possible. And I also, this is my first time at Strange Loop, so I don't really know the backgrounds of people here. But I understand that most of you are programmers. Um, I think the takeaway here shouldn't be that we built a particular system or a particular compiler and that you can use it, but more that we were faced with a particular problem and we used certain uh, techniques and frameworks to solve that problem. Um, I also need to stress that um, what I'm presenting today is a proof of concept. Um, most of the components are open source, but I don't have like a full, um, like I don't have a, a URL I can give you at the end of the talk. Um, I can, I can, I will have URLs for some parts of it so that you could go play with it later if you want. All right, so I think, I guess the right place to start is uh, what is homomorphic encryption? So a homomorphism, if you ask a mathematician, is it, it's some sort of transformation that preserves structure. And in this case, the structure I want to preserve is the ability to decrypt later. So a transformation then that I might be interested in is given two integers that are ciphertext, how do you add those together you know, to, in the normal way to get a new ciphertext that can be decrypted? And in the process, the, the computer that adds them together isn't allowed to decrypt isn't allowed to decrypt them in the process. They don't have the private key. Um, and the way, like the, the sort of abstraction that the, the homomorphic encryption community gave us is this thing called arithmetic circuits. And um, I'm not going to go too much into the mathematics behind it, but um, mathematicians refer to this structure as a ring. Um, so it's, uh, in this case, so you could pick lots of rings. Um, for efficiency reasons, we stuck to um, integer and arithmetic operations on integers. You could also pick like a Boolean ring. Um, so the arithmetic operations we support are addition, and th this is like normal addition. So it's associative, which means if you have three numbers you're adding together, um, and addition is binary, so you can add you know, these two first and then this one, and that's the same as adding the other two first and this one. Um, it's commutative, which means if you have A plus B, you can also add B plus A and get the same result. Identity means that uh, zero does what you expect zero to do. Um, there's also inverses, so we have subtraction. Um, in this case, we also have multiplication. Um, well, all, all rings have multiplication. The thing that's different in this case is our multiplication is commutative, which is, again, that property that if you multiply A times B versus B times A, you'll get the same result. Um, notice there's no inverses, though, for multiplication, so we don't, in general, have division. Um, we have a distributivity law, which is just another way of saying that addition and multiplication interact the way you expect. There's nothing um, unusual or new to learn there. Um, the, the thing that I want to like reemphasize, though, is that all of this happens on values that are indistinguishable from, ra from random noise. Uh, if you were to inspect during the computation the two integers you're adding or multiplying or whatever, um, they just look like noise. Uh, but when you're all done, you can still decrypt it. And the, the sort of the theory of HE, uh, like that's kind of all you get. But there's a little bit more sometimes. So uh, this will come up again later in the talk. But um, the people we worked with, um, the implementers of the HE library that we used, they came up with kind of a clever uh, hack to support a restricted form of division in certain cases, like with some restrictions. So that's, that's what I mean by sometimes a bit more. Um, but, but 
there's a lot of things that you won't get out of this. So um, there's no control flow. So there's no if statements. Um, there's no memory. Like there's nothing, nowhere to store a value or, or read a value from other than you know variables. Uh, will like your ciphertext will be holding a value. Um, so maybe it helps to give a little bit of an example. Um, so this this is the actual concrete syntax we use for specifying our arithmetic circuits. In this case, the first line says there's a wire named zero, and it's an, takes a, it provides an input which is a ciphertext. There's a, a wire named uh, one which also has a ciphertext, and then there's a wire two which is hard coded to the constant eight, and then there's a wire coming out of an of a, an addition gate and it takes as inputs wires 1, 0, and 2, and the overall circuit um, could have multiple outputs in general. In this case, it just outputs whatever's on wire 3. Um, but, you know, all, all of that is, is kind, of, um, kind, of, kind of technical and theoretical. What I really want you to take away from these arithmetic circuits and what the homomorphic encryption is in this case is that they're integer polynomials. So they have integer coefficients, and the variables take on integer values. Um, and and that's, that's really the intuition I want you to have at this point. And I, I think that's great. I think it's great that these are polynomials. And I, I don't know if you think it's great. Polynomials are, are really awesome. Uh, to the point that uh, once in 2011, I posted this on Math Overflow where I said, uh, I think polynomials are one of the greatest inventions of humankind. Not only are they extremely flexible and come up in so many domains of math, but they've led to interesting breakthroughs. For example, uh, trying to find the closed form solution of the quintic polynomial led Everest Galois to uh, lay down the base theory that became group theory, which also is where we have rings. So uh, polynomials are great. I, I might be biased. <laughs> Uh, you might have also noticed the company I work for is named Galois after that Everest Galois. All right. So homomorphic encryption. So now you, you kind of know vaguely what it is. So what's it good for? Now this one's a little bit harder for me because I don't really know of any sort of like, um, I don't really know of any applications where people are using it in the wild. So these are kind of a little bit hypothetical. Um, but one example I like to give people is trust is not transitive. So I, I might trust my doctor, but I don't necessarily trust everybody my doctor trusts. So let's say my doctor has genomic data for me, and my doctor says, well, there's this maybe research group or this company or something that can do some sort of analysis using your genome along with some other data sets they have, and they can uh, predict you know, whether you might have certain diseases. And it's like, oh, well, that's exciting. Let's, let's do that. And so um, using HE, you might encrypt your genomic data, uh, you know, your doctor then sends that to this party that you don't necessarily trust. Um, they're able to mix that with maybe some other encrypted data from other people, do some number crunching, send back the result, and your doctor can decrypt it, and then maybe tell you something about your genome. Um, there's maybe some other examples you can imagine with cloud computing or something like that. Um, Ah, oh, right, yeah, so I, I also want to talk about um, what are the problems with it, right? So uh, if, if HE is so great, why are we not all using it already? Um, and as I understand it, there's at least two problems with making it practical. And the first problem is bad performance. Um, and when I say bad performance, I mean something like five to 10 orders of magnitude worse than just directly doing the computation on your CPU, <laughs> right? Which is, which is a pretty big, pretty big difference. Um, the other problem, which was called out actually, I can't remember who specifically, I'm not a cryptographer, but some well-respected cryptographer specifically called this one out, which is, it's, it's kind of hard to program. I mean, I like polynomials, but maybe not everybody does. Um, yeah, so what's the big deal? It's polynomials. All right, so, so this is sort of my contrived example. This, this is, um, I will show you how this actually can work. But let's do image processing. So this is kind of blown up and huge, but the source image was a 64 by 64 image. Um, and you want to go from before to after. So it's a very simple sharpening algorithm. Um, I'll let you decide whether you would actually want to sharpen that image. Um, 
So the question is, you know, what, what polynomial do you write down to sharpen a 64 by 64 image? And, and we, can, we can talk about a Julia program for that. So this is just a normal Julia program that will do the kind of image sharpening I'm talking about. So it has this weight matrix, which is a three by three matrix for computing a weighted sum of a neighborhood of each pixel in the image. And so then uh, a little bit further down is this for loop uh, that goes over the whole image minus the, the, the boundary of the image. And then an inner loop that actually computes that weighted sum. And we're going to write all these new pixels to this image too. And there's also this kind of right shift, um, which I think I mentioned before. There was this like limited support for division. So uh, I'll get into the details about that a little bit later. But keep in mind, it's the last operation that we do on the ciphertext. If, if, if we were able to feed in a ciphertext. All right, so, so the question again. So now I've given you a nice specification for the image sharpening. Should be really easy to write down a polynomial, right? <laughs> well, a 64 by 64 image is going to have over 4,000 variables in it. And it's also going to lack all the structure that we had when we had a Julia program, right? Um, so the fact that we were using a, a weighted neighborhood, um, you, you won't be able to see that in the polynomial. So I guess, I guess the question is, um, you know, could, could we get the computer to derive the polynomial that we need from this program? And the answer turns out to be yes, or else I wouldn't be here. Um, and, the, and the way that we did that was symbolic execution. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a minute to see if there's any questions on Slido, um, just so we don't get like a backlog of questions, all right? Let me hit refresh. All right, I don't see any questions yet. All right, so I want to I want to talk about symbolic manipulation. Um, so if you know this is a concrete math problem, right? So five plus five plus three, and you get thirteen. But if you've if you've taken maybe like high school algebra or something like that, you start using letters, right? So then you have x plus x plus three is two x plus three. And you know that if x is 5, you're going to get 13 again. So we, we can get computers to do this. And we can also generalize it to uh, programs and not just expressions, right? So if we had this if statement, um, it's going to return a when a and b are equal. And when a is greater than b, it'll return b. And otherwise, it'll return negative 1. So we could boil that down into a set of values and say that that statement in the program really is like multi-valued. And the way you would sort of naturally represent this is maybe the like tuples, a set of tuples. So uh, this, and the way you would read this is returns a when a equals b, and b when a is greater than b, and negative one in the other case. And I kind of, my conditions here are a little simplified because I carefully chose this example so that the, if the branches of the if statement are disjoint. So symbolic execution is, is basically you build, a, you build a normal interpreter for a programming language, and then you sort of generalize it with symbolic manipulation, like I was just describing. And um, it, it turns out to be very powerful, but also you quickly run into the theoretical limits of computer science. Um, if, so this, this bullet point is a reference to that you know, that if it terminates. So I can, I can sort of symbolically evaluate your program, and you've given me some known inputs and some unknown inputs, and it runs for a while and gets, gets back an answer. And that answer um, is going to have all the side effects removed, because for all the, all the known values, I'm able to actually compute things. So side effects are, um, you know, if the, if the program said, well, if, you're, if your matrix is too large, then it's an error. Um, well, if we, if we run it on something with a small enough matrix, then, then we know that is dead code for that run of the program. And so that side effect of like, throwing an exception when the matrix is the wrong size can just be removed from the, from the final thing we output. And so I like to think of this final output as being a functional specification of what that program would have computed given those inputs. Um, runtimes 
are not great for symbolic execution um, because you're basically running the program, you know, when it has a symbolic input, you're sort of running the program as if it were running on all values that symbolic input could take. Plus, you have all of the normal execution overhead and, and the bookkeeping overheads. So it's, it's sort of always going to be at least as bad as if you just ran programs concretely. Um, it's built on decades of really interesting research. You know, uh, ICFP was going on here earlier this week and is maybe still going on. And, you know, those folks uh, have contributed to that kind of research. Um, and, and I kind of like to describe it as magical, but a friend of mine was like, oh, it's, you know, if you say it's magical, that, that's kind of bad um, because people are like, but, but I want to understand it. And, and that's fair. Um, I think it's magical, but uh, at his advice, I put in that, you know, it works surprisingly well sometimes. <laughs> All right, I will, I will check again uh, for questions. Maybe get some water. All right, so now that I've given you some background, um, I'm going to describe um, the compiler that we built, which again is a proof of concept, and I, I can't actually give you the working compiler at the moment. Um, we built it from, since, since this was a sort of like a lightweight investigation that IARPA wanted, and we were just building a proof of concept, it was really important for us to pick things that already existed and fit them together in an in interesting way. So we used the Julia programming language, and I'll get into more of why we picked that, but um, that's a nice open source language. Probably folks in this room are familiar with it. Um, we also used Crucible, which is a symbolic evaluation framework that we develop at Galois. Um, that's also open source. Um, it's written in Haskell. Uh, it's one of the more complicated and interesting Haskell code bases that I know of. Um, we also use this library called Palisade. Palisade is how we do our, our HE. Um, that's developed by Kurt Roloff and his graduate students at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, in, he refers to it as a lattice cryptography library. I'm not a cryptographer, so I, that doesn't mean much to me, but maybe it does to you. All right, so Julia, it's open source. Being open source was really nice to us um, because it meant so when we first started this project, we didn't really know how we were going to solve this problem. And being able to dive into the source code of Julia meant that if we had any questions about how Julia works, we could answer them ourselves. You know, there's a chance that we could ask, also ask the authors of the project. And being open source actually makes that even easier because who, who has worked on it is going to be public, right? We don't have to have a point of contact at a company or something like that. Um, it was also nice that it targeted scientific users. So for our hypothetical examples, um, it, it made them more plausible, right? Because maybe that genomic example I gave before, maybe a data scientist working in Julia came up with an algorithm that they thought was interesting. Uh, it's it's uh, actively maintained with a, like a, a steadily growing community. It seems to be getting more traction all the time. That was attractive to us. Um, We've used the 0.5 version of Julia because we started this project about two, two and a half years ago at this point. And I think that's the version that was stable at the time. And then pretty quickly, they moved to 0.6. And then in August, they released 1.0. Um, I don't think anything in our work is uh, really tied to the specific version of Julia that we used. But it won't immediately translate to the newer version because we we just happen to depend on a few internal details of Julia at the moment. All right, so Julia is a great language, but it's full of dynamic features. Um, you, you can statically write down types, but for the most part, it's a dynamically typed language. Um, you know, it expects a heap, uh, a stack, mutable variables, all this stuff. And this is the point where I joined the team. I joined the team after they had already been working on it for about a month or two. And uh, I almost quit the project because I was like, you guys are insane. I, I don't know how you're going to solve this problem. Um, you're doomed. Uh, you know, I was moping around the, the lunchroom at work going, oh, what have I gotten myself into? You know, hey, Rob, what, what do you think about this? Rob's one of my coworkers who developed Crucible. And he's like, you know, this sounds like a symbolic evaluation problem. It's like, go on. 
All right, so yeah, his answer to me was, try out Crucible. Um, and, and just as a fun little factoid, at the time, Crucible already had a front end called Grackle, which I'll, I'll have a link to later in the slides, which is, uh, originally Crucible was developed to do symbolic simulation of MATLAB programs. So in the very, very few, first few weeks when we wanted to try out this idea, we actually pretended that MATLAB was Julia. All right. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about like, how, you, how you use our compiler. So you write a Julia program, like the, the one I showed you early on in the talk, the image sharpening program. That, that would be a suitable program. Um, then using Crucible, you, you feed your Julia program into Crucible. Actually, we have a library that'll help you with this. Um, and Crucible will grind away on your program, and you need to tell it which inputs are symbolic and which are concrete. And then if it terminates, what you'll get back from Crucible is an arithmetic circuit. Um, you'll also get back, um, well, maybe I'll talk about that in a minute. There's a little bit of metadata you'll also get back. All right, so then you would take your, take your data, whatever your, uh, you know, your genomic data maybe, or your image, and you encrypt it um, using Palisade. And then you, you give your ciphertext and your arithmetic circuit to Palisade, and you let it run for a while. And you know, again, this is five to 10 orders of magnitude slower than if you did the computation directly. And, and keep in mind, we picked this integer ring, these integer polynomials, because they're more efficient. So if you did fully homomorphic encryption, for example, the story would be even worse. All right, so then, uh, you know, in more time than it took me to describe that, Palisade will give you back your answer. It, it can actually be kind of fast on some small inputs. Um, and then you can decrypt your results. And so like, that's, that's like the full thing. Like, um, you know, we, we wrote a library in Julia that does some of the orchestration for you to make it easy to do some of these steps, like step number two, step number four, um, and you know, getting the answers back. Um, that actually turns out to be a little bit harder than you would not harder, a little more tedious than you would like, so we automate that as well. All right, so, so when, when you want to use Crucible for something, so, so uh, you may remember I said one of the things I wanted people to get out of this talk was this idea that there's these tools and techniques out there and that you might want to use them at some point. So I think it's useful to talk a little bit about how you would use Crucible. So Crucible internally has sort of a, an imperative programming language defined inside it, and it's at a pretty low level. Um, where you've got basic blocks and you've got uh, different kinds of statements. You've got, um, you've got arbitrary control flow though, which is maybe surprising considering it's gonna be doing this complicated symbolic execution thing. But again, it's just a generalization of normal execution. So you can just think of it as an interpreter for a programming language. And it just so happens that sometimes values are variable and, and not completely known. Um, and so what we do is we, we reflect on your Julia program and we, we get its AST and then we can even ask the, the Julia, the standard Julia compiler, um, you know, lower this code for, a, lower this code a bit. So, you know, desugar it, turn it into a, a bit of a simpler intermediate language. And this was nice. We, we didn't have to write a parser, um, which I, don't know if the Julia folks have addressed this yet, but the last time I checked, they didn't have a, a parser description outside of their own implementation. So you know, this saved us a bit of work trying to, to, trying to understand what their grammar was, and we didn't have to worry about bugs, like we weren't going to misparse it. We, weren't, we didn't have to understand, you know, we had this small budget, we didn't have to understand how they desugar programs, um, so that saved us time. Uh, it's very, very nice to be able to use reflection in this way. Um, but we, we take that program, we, we, we get the AST, and then we convert it to an S expression, which is, that's just sort of an implementation detail. We could have used JSON or lots of other formats. And, uh, and then we give that, uh, that program to Crucible. Um, and then translating that into Crucible is fairly easy. That all happens in Haskell. Um, again, it supports arbitrary con control flow, so you know, Julia's exceptions and whatnot are no problem for us. Um, figuring out how to support uh, structured data was actually harder. And the reason that's harder is because, well, well two reasons. Um, 
I guess they're in the wrong order here because uh, the, the first reason is you only get integers to work with, that second bullet point. Um, and so if you, like if you have a matrix and you wanna you know, uh, send that to, to your homomorphic encryption, you know, your arithmetic circuit, your polynomial, you can just flatten it out and keep track of what shape it had, like which elements of that list uh, go where in the, the matrix. But you know, if you wanna represent um, like a sum type or like a tree or something like that, things are gonna get a little trickier. Um, the other problem we had was where to make things symbolic and where they always had to be concrete. So we knew, we knew that the, the polynomials we were going to use, your loops needed to be fully unrolled by the time you get to that. So we decided that it didn't make sense for your, um, your matrices to have symbolic shape, that they had to have concrete shape, like we had to know that they were a two by three matrix, but the elements could be symbolic. So that was a trade-off we made, and uh, that basically comes up every time you want to support some sort of structured data. Um, and one of the side effects of doing this compilation is some metadata. And it's this, this problem I mentioned where you, know, you only get integers to work with, so somewhere else you have to store like what was the structure. And um, in this case, I call it metadata because in general that's what it would be. In the specific case that we're working with, with Julia, it's very easy to like, um, load up some code and evaluate it. So that's actually what we do, is we emit like, a function that says, like, how do you reshape this list of integers that you're gonna get from the circuit back into the data you cared about? So that it becomes transparent to the user on both ends. Both, you know, you just pass arbitrary Julia values to the HE, and you get back a Julia value from the HE. That's what you see as a user. All right, so how it all fits together. Um, this is sort of our architectural diagram. So the, this, uh, I guess this would be the left, this Julia system, fhe.jl is the library we wrote in Julia, just a normal Julia library. It doesn't hook into the internals in any way except the part where we lower the code and depend a little bit on the structure of that. Uh, but we didn't write like a C extension or anything like that to Julia. So when you, so I had that workflow diagram before, right? So step one was write your Julia program. So that happens on the left here. And then uh, <coughs> generating your circuit and, and your metadata, that's, the, um, that's this S expression arrow that goes over to Crucible. And the arrow that comes back is your circuit and, and that one will have the metadata. Um, and then this next arrow that says circuit plus input ciphertext. So that's, that's the step where, um, you know, you've got your arithmetic circuit, you've, you've, uh, Julia has flattened out your, your structured data into lists, or just one list, really. Um, and then we feed that all over to Palisade, and the version of Palisade that we used for this research has a special, like, circuit interpreter built on top of it, and then that grind, that would grind away, and this bottom arrow, output ciphertext, is that last step, where then it comes back into Julia, and then the crucible had output this Julia function for reshaping your data, and so then we would call that, and you get your data back, and it would, you know, it's like it never went anywhere, except there was a long wait in the middle. Um, all right, so I will, I will check again if there's any questions, and, but the next part of the talk is, I'm, I'm gonna go over some of the things that we learned along the way. All right. Oh. How's that? Thank you. Uh, can the symbolic executor handle programs that translate to exponential or other transcendental functions? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think if, if you could unroll that into a polynomial, I think the answer is yes. Um, Transcendental functions, probably not. Um, we don't, like the form of division that we have, it has to be the last thing you do on a ciphertext, and you can only divide by powers of two. So, <laughs> some restrictions may apply. <laughs> Does an HE-based algorithm expect all instances of the same input to have the same ciphertext? If values uh, include a nonce salt, can they still be analyzed? Um, 
I don't know the answer to that one. I'm, I'm not a cryptographer. Um, all right. Uh, next question. Did you all consider using other methods of secure computation that are more performant than homomorphic encryption? Um, yeah, so, so we, when we were talking to IARPA, they were specifically interested in homomorphic encryption. So uh, for the scope of this work, we didn't. At Galois generally, we, we have had projects that, that look at those other forms of secure computation for sure. Um, I haven't worked on those projects personally, so I can't really comment on the details though. All right, next question. Is the integer circuit itself also encrypted? No, it's not. Um, the, the integer circuit uh, is, is like anybody can inspect that. Um, that's not part of the, the privacy. All right. Uh, so I think I've, I've kind of mentioned this already. So, so Julia ended up being really nice. So I, this is the what did we learn? So I hadn't used Julia prior to this project. So to me, this is one of the things we learned is, hey, Julia is great for this because it's got reflection and it's got macros. And we used both of those. Um, it's okay if you can't read this slide. This slide is basically just showing you this is the API surface of the library that we made in Julia. And all you need to take away from this is we had a way to do key gen. Uh, we had a way to encrypt and decrypt uh, your values. And then we had a form of evaluation that takes a function and its arguments. And we also had another macro version of evaluation so that if you wanted to be in a larger computational context and just have like the body of the loop um, do HE every time you go through the loop, you could use this macro version. And it would just, at that point in the program, when it needed to do that part uh, using HE, it would just go through the workflow that I described before for that expression. Um, so there's, of course, no free lunches. Uh, like the one you'll have today is already paid for. Um, yeah, so you can't always use the algorithm you want. Um, you know, the question previously was about transcendental functions. You know, good luck with that because we don't have general division. Um, uh, we used, uh, one of our early examples was doing something statistical, and I think it was linear regression, and we needed a determinant function for that. And, you know, the, the determinant functions that were sort of built into things weren't suitable for that, either because they, they used the real numbers or something like that. Um, so we used this thing, this implementation of the ter determinant that Richard Bird, who's a functional programming researcher, came up with. Um, and... This, I don't expect you to read this. I mentioned earlier that maybe, maybe we used MATLAB a little bit in the very beginning, and the code, the code on the, the right is actually in MATLAB. So, you know, this code is in Julia. But what I want you to take away from this is the short version, that's naive determinant. Um, very easy to write, it's short, it's simple. Um, it's also something like n factorial runtime. The, the other code is an, a MATLAB impl implementation of Richard Bird's uh, integer-only determinant function, um, which, is, which is quite different. Like, if you look at them structurally, it's just like, what, how are these even the same computation? Um, and I, I think Bird's, given our implementation of matrix multiplication, is something like n to the fourth. So these n here is the size of the, you know, these are square matrices of size n by n. Um, so, so we kind of had this question once. So we couldn't get the naive determinant to scale beyond about like um, eight by eight matrices. So we kind of were faced with this question of like, you know, we want to use this other one, but is it the same? Well, it turns out that once you've done all this stuff with symbolic evaluation and you have this functional specification of your, of your computation on its inputs, then you can, you can ask um, you can query like these pretty advanced solvers like SAT solvers and SMT solvers, and it's okay if you don't know what those terms mean, but they, they're logic solvers and they're very powerful. And we can query them and we can say, given, given this functional spe specification of this determinant on you know, a two by two matrix and this one on a two by two matrix, where, what's the set of, of matrix values where they disagree, where they produce a different result? And if, it, if the solver comes back and says, that's the empty set, then we go, great, they produce the same output on all values for two by two. And so we did that for sizes um, two by two up to eight by eight, 
And, and every time the solver answered back, they're computing the same thing. Like that set's empty where they differ. And so that was good enough evidence for us, for our proof of concept, to move on. But I think this is a general thing that people in this room might want to know about, is that if, if, you, if you are using something, um, I'll talk about it later, we, we developed this thing called the Software Analysis Workbench. Um, if you're using uh, the MATLAB simulator that I'll show you later, um, if you're using any of these things, then you can, um, you know, you might be able to prove equivalence of your programs instead of testing. Um, all right, so another thing we ran into was that very large circuits could be a problem. So we wrote all this code in Haskell, which is a fantastic language to program in, and sometimes it eats your heap. Um, and in our case, we were building up the circuit all in memory, all at once, and we ran out of heap. And uh, so we had to switch to a streaming, uh, a streaming way of writing that out. Um, another thing that we learned was symbolic loop constants can be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so this is greatest common divisor, just a very simple recursive version of it. You could write it with a while loop and it'll have the same problems. If A and B are symbolic inputs, uh, it's very hard for the symbolic executor to know when to stop. You, you can set up or bounds on this, but it's very hard to know to stop precisely when you've computed the GCD. Um, and, and because of problems like this, and the reason it arises is because all of your conditionals are on symbolic values. So programs that you want to, to encode this way through our compiler, you want to avoid that. Um, and you know, this can be tricky because maybe you refactor your program and now you know, it was working and now it's not. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned equivalence proving is pretty interesting. Um, SIMD style parallelism um, might become easier once you've done this because the, in our case, since we're getting out just an expression graph um, and, and in general, you could get out function calls or something in your final value, but we've specially picked inputs that don't do that. Um, but if you get out an expression graph like we did, you can do data flow analysis on it very easily. Um, one of the limitations of this work is, or sorry, um, you, like the semantic accuracy of, of what you're doing can be a limitation. So um, there's another symbolic execution framework that's probably m more widely known named CLI, and that one doesn't follow all paths through the program, so it wouldn't have worked for us because it would mean that some inputs in your circuits, just we wouldn't know what to compute. Um, and there's also the question of how well did we match the, the Julia implementation when we re-implemented parts of it. So we had to implement matrix multiplication inside Crucible, um, and you know, does, it, does it accurately match what Julia does is, a, is kind of a hard question. Um, and yeah, as a reminder, we didn't work on the performance problem. We worked on the usability problem. Can, can normal programmers, normal Julia programmers use HE? That was what we were trying to address. All right, so I mentioned these before. So Grackle is the MATLAB symbolic interpreter that, that we developed. Um, SAW is a software analysis workbench. It also uses Crucible, but in a different way. SAW is for translating programs in, written in languages like C or Rust. Um, I forget what, what all languages we support there. Um, translating them into a common representation and then allowing you to reason about them. So one of the ways you might reason is the equivalence checking that I mentioned before. And then um, if you're interested in the HE, Palisade is uh, pretty cool. Um, and that's developed, again, by Kurt Roloff at New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I think that's it. <laughs>